before? Do you engage in online and offline networking, but feel like you're not getting the right value from your efforts? These common challenges may be preventing you from tapping into the transformative power of networking. If this rings true for you, then today's session on how to network effectively online and offline is definitely for you. Hello and welcome to the Dare to Differentiate show, where we're all about helping you own your voice, value, and visibility with confidence. Drop a comment to let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm your host, Diana YK Chan, LinkedIn top voice of 2022, LinkedIn learning instructor and founder of My Marketability, where I help you differentiate your brand, build your network, and communicate with confidence. Whether you're tuning in live or watching the replay, I am so delighted that you're here. If we're not connected yet, make sure to follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube. All right, so some exciting announcements. So this week, my fourth LinkedIn Learning Nano course just launched called Digital Networking, where I share with you 11 uh, videos all about networking in under six minutes. So make sure to check it out. It's free on LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning. I'm just going to take you six minutes long. I encourage you to watch it, share it. If you like it, give it a like, a thumbs up, and also give it a glowing five-star review. Feel free to tag me once you're done watching the course as well. If you've already watched a course, comment to let me know in the chat as well there. All right. So today, we're going to be navigating the networking nuances with my friend, Anna. Anna is the founder of The Current Diet. She's a top-notch career coach and job search strategist with a whopping 280,000 followers across Instagram and TikTok. Within a few years, she's helped over 600 professionals globally. Her mission is to empower ambitious professionals to take control of their career so that they discover and land their dream job without the overwhelm and applying for hundreds of jobs. Anna is among the top 1% of instructors for course sales on Thinkific, stamping her mark of excellence with her best-selling course, Network Like a Pro. So let's all give a shout out to Anna. Type in hashtag go Anna. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I see many of you here on LinkedIn already. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Some of these key questions that Anna and I are going to be asking each other today. We're going to talk about what makes networking effective, both offline and online. How do they, how are they different? How can we turn casual online connections into valuable professional relationships? How can we leave a lasting impression in digital networking? And what roles does personal branding play? How can someone transition and, trans and career transition leverage their network to, uh, into a new role or industry? What techniques can we use to keep networking conversations flowing and avoiding awkward silences? And what should we do when it comes to preparing for networking events or meetings? And what are some of the common networking mistakes that we should avoid? And how to use social media for networking without coming across as uh, disingenuous or spam spammy? And lastly, how crucial um, is following up in networking there? And what are the strategies to doing it effectively without being intrusive? So if you're excited about today's session, type in a plus one. Okay? Type in a plus one if you're excited. So I just want to say hello. We have an amazing audience with us today right now from Toronto, Houston, Indiana, Spain, California, Ottawa. Amazing. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Texas. Awesome. All right, and from the Philippines as well. Amazing, it's such a, a great international audience. So some housekeeping key reminders here is that replay will be available. We'll be adding timestamps on my YouTube channel uh, later on as well. So make sure just go hop onto my YouTube channel to check that if there's a particular segment you wanna to go to. I wanna encourage you to network with others in the comments, okay? Share your thoughts, key learnings and questions, engage with one another, click like and comment anytime, uh, show support for one another as well, okay? All right, so let's welcome my friend Anna to the show. Hello, I am so excited, Anna. This is my favorite topic. And I feel like I say that about every single topic when it comes to job search and careers, but I will say networking is probably one of my favorites. So, so oh. excited. Amazing, amazing. I'm so glad. Like, this is your second time back in like a month. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it because you told me you love networking. I'm like, you know, who's who's a great guest to have? I'm like, and I, I message you and they're like, yes, I'm in. I remember when I messaged you while I was on vacation at the spa and you're just like, yep, I'm in. <laughs> Amazing. So let's do some, um, uh, a kick, uh, some kickstart some questions here before we dive into our topic here. Lit. Why don't we share a little with each other? The audience here is why do we love 
networking. And why do we each create a course on networking? <laughs> Let's share some stories here. Love this question. So I personally didn't actually love networking from the beginning. In fact, for a few years, when I first started my career, I did not like networking and I didn't really even understand it. But I did see people in my life land incredible job opportunities. And I remember thinking, well, why is it working for them? And it's not really working for me. And it wasn't actually until way later, I learned that what they did to make it happen was relying heavily on networking, relying heavily on referrals and getting those people that they have connected with to help them in their interview process as well. And once I started to see that just firsthand in my life, that, oh, it is working for other people, I said, okay, well, what if I try? And if you know my story at all, I used to be an international student, so I had zero connections when I started. I am very much an introvert, so it's not really something that I felt like would come easy to me. And it was just not something that I knew how to do because I was living abroad. No one who I grew up with told me what it is and how to do it. So I just said, I'm just going to try. I'm just going to give it my best and learn. And it did take me a while to get to a point where I'm actually really good at it. But once I started, the, just the magic, I, I felt like something magical was happening because all of a sudden, people who I just met were helping me. They were introducing me to more people. They were referring me for job opportunities. They were helping me throughout my interview process, I was blown away. And over time, I learned that it's definitely a skill. It's not something you're born with. You just get better as you learn this, as you practice as a skill. And I actually went from not knowing what it is, being an introvert, I mean, scared, terrified, I'm going to say terrified to do it, to building a career in sales where I was networking for a living. My job was to find people, reach out to them, book meetings, and then try to get those meetings to lead to something in the future. So I definitely have been through it all <laughs> and just seeing what it can do for, for your career, what it did for my career, which was pivoting twice from accounting to, uh, to design, to recruitment. All of that was really me heavily relying on networking. And now it has helped hundreds of my students do the same. So I just see the power in networking. And that's why I wanted to create a course and help others bridge that same bridge that I did, <laughs> where Love I it. felt like it was so scary. It was terrifying. I felt like I'm just not set up for success as an introvert, as an international student, as someone who spoke English or speaks English as a foreign language. I just didn't think I was set up for success, but then I excelled at building the skill and I wanted for other people to have that experience too and fall in love with networking the same way I did. What about you, Diana? I love that story. I love the story. I, I, and if you can relate to this, like type in a plus one because I can totally relate to you, Anna, because I came to Canada all by myself when I was 16 from Hong Kong and I had like a zero network. And now I have a thriving global network. And for me, what I love about networking is the opportunity to, to learn, to help one another, to discover new opportunities. And what I've discovered, you know, before even starting my business, pretty much all my corporate jobs were land through networking or through a recommendation. So uh, like my first job, like landing out of school was through networking, attending an information session. And the next opportunity after my, my um, MBA in consulting was because a referral from my manager that got me that interview, even though I got initially rejected. And then following me, like working at Google was because my MBA classmate uh, remembered that I have a passion for people and then referred me for that. So and then the last 10 years being in my own business, I really see the power of of networking relationship building of how I've landed opportunities, whether it's through speaking at the UN seven times, that's just this past year because of my client recommending me or becoming a LinkedIn learning instructor because someone's been following me, a content manager been following me for years and finally we got connected. And so I really see the power of that. And you and I think about how you and I got connected, Anna, like we literally just met three months ago. 
what do you think? We only met three months ago. It's because of a mutual connection, our, our friend, Kip Newman, who introduced us. And because of that, you came to my mastermind. And because we're both in Toronto, we're able to go out a few times together, go to some networking events. Um, and then fast forward a couple of weeks, you and I are going to Paris together for a women's mastermind. And so I really love this idea. I know a lot of times people feel like networking may feel icky or awkward, but if we really turn it into, I look at it, it's really about how to really deepen relationships, having meaningful conversations and uncovering like new possibilities. And I think about how you and I, like we've already collaborated a few times already, like you being on my show the last month or so, and we've only known each other for, for three months. And so that's why we really love, I love like networking and back to like why we, I like we're going to talk about why I created this course that just literally launched on a couple of days ago here on digital networking is really a look at the last several years, right? Really um, since COVID is that networking has gone more global, more digital, right? My network building has gone from local to global because of the power of social media, right? So I have so many people that I know through LinkedIn that I'm able to have a great relationship and collaborate with. And that's why I really create a course like this and really think about how to network effectively online, not just in person there. And I love that we're able to talk about this topic today on online and offline there. And I'll, I'll just add one piece here around online networking. When I started my journey over 10 years ago, most of networking was done in person. I don't even know if Zoom existed back then. And all of the networking that I was doing in the beginning of my career over 10 years ago was in person. Now I see my clients network with people in different countries, in different cities, and that's what helps them to land opportunities globally mm. because in how the world has changed in the last, what, two, three years, it's so much more um, accepted, I guess, and common yeah. to connect online and to connect on Zoom. So that's such great news for all of you here. It means that now you can take your career to the next level even faster absolutely even much faster now right if you're looking to network more globally like type in global as well if you want to build your network globally type that in right like now it's like much easier than ever before to network and we want to encourage you if you want to learn more also deeper we're going to talk about networking but check out also Anna's course network like a pro course um, on her website there check it out I also have my mini course that launched this week on digital networking on LinkedIn learning there. So, so check that out. So for those who just joined, welcome to the show on how to network effectively online and offline. Today, Anna and I are going to be asking each other questions. We have 10 questions in total that we're going to cover. So we ask each other. So feel free to chime in in terms of your thoughts or questions that you have uh, for us there. So let's get started here. All right. Uh, I have a question for you uh, to kick this off. And that is, what are some of the key elements that make, in from your perspective, that make networking effective, both online and offline? And how offline and online networking is different? How is it different? That is such a great question, right? There are differences, but there are also similarities, right? So for me, I think, first of all, is the first step, like something I teach in the course about first is defining your goals. What are your goals when it comes to networking? Uh, what type of network you want to build. You really want to approach networking um, in a way that is essentially meaningful for you because otherwise you're going to uh, uh, drain. And so when I think about networking, the difference between online and offline is number one is you also need to adapt your communication accordingly, right? Because online communication often involves like written communication, DMing people, um, whereas offline, you really want to pay attention also to the nonverbal cues like the body language, your tone of voice, that plays a crucial role there. One of my key principles around is really around building genuine connections to in order to build effective networking relationships is that you got to be authentic, whether it's online or offline. The quality of your connections matter more than the quantity. Okay. It's really important to be genuinely interested in others. Right. I always say, like, you know, um, be naturally curious and genuinely interested in people there and really listen actively. Pay attention to things that may not be said there. The other piece is really around following up. Right. Following is a huge, huge principle that I would say that we really need to to keep in mind. Um, you know, Anna, you can tell the story later in terms of even following up when we're trying to we're trying to meet someone new when you were trying to get like your your own course as well. The number of times we need to follow up to get approved. Right. A lot of times I hear from clients that, oh, I reached out to three people or 10 people. I haven't heard back. And I ask, like, have you followed up? 
right? Most people give up after the first try because they have not heard back from people, right? If you can get at least that 30, 40% like response rate, right? It means that something is working, but continue. Don't just give up so easily there, okay? And one of my favorite formula towards networking is all about the ABCs of networking. Always be connecting, always be curious, always be cultivating as you never know what opportunities may unfold there. Anything you want to add, Anna? I love that so much. And I know that we'll be diving a little bit deeper into the follow-ups and uh, leading the meeting. So I, I'm, I, I do have quite a few kind of tips that I would love to share, but I think let's maybe keep it for, yeah. for when we dive deeper into, into those very specific topics. Perfect. Perfect. And I want to hear from the audience last, as well. By the way, last the ABCs, such a good way to remember it for yourself. Love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my question for you is how should one prepare for uh, networking events and meetings? What are the key do's and don'ts? Mm-hmm. That is an excellent question. And I am happy that that's where we're starting. In fact, this is something that I have a full lesson on inside my course because it is so crucial how you're preparing for your networking meeting. And a lot of people don't really prepare. <laughs> they just are happy that they got a meeting, that they have this event on their calendar, and that's kind of it. However, for all of you here to make sure that you are networking effectively, here are three tips that I have to prepare for a networking meeting. Number one, get genuinely curious and prepare questions ahead of time. I'm going to offer you this. Don't ask questions that you can easily Google the answer to. So if you're asking very simple, very high level questions that are easily found, the answers are easily found online, those, are, those questions are not good enough. Tip number two, let them talk. 90% of the time, it should be the other person talking, not you. So we get into this mode where during networking, we feel like we need to pitch ourselves. We need to tell them everything about where we're coming from and what we want to do. But that's the number one rule that I learned working in sales is that those, especially initial meetings, when you're just getting to know someone, 90% of the time, I vividly remember my, my sales VP telling me that 90% 90, 90 of the time, it's them speaking. So when they ask you a question, let's say, it's still a conversation. They ask you a question, answer that question with one or two sentences and bring it back to them with another question. That's, that's a big one, my friends. And number three is have a clear goal going into your networking meeting. So your goal number one with networking is always to learn. <laughs> and you always want to have that secondary goal whether it's the first meeting or the fifth meeting. And if it's a networking meeting 101, your goal can be asking, your secondary goal can be asking for the next step. That can be asking for a referral or asking for advice about something very specific. Now, when you're going to events, I would suggest for that secondary goal, to, is, uh, to be you getting that initial connection, that initial face-to-face -face introduction, getting their name, getting their contact details so that now you can follow up and book that one-on-one -on -one meeting. I love that. I love these tips. I want to share a little bit about, because the distinguish between networking events and meetings is a little different. And I want to share a story. Last year, I attended the LinkedIn Learning Instructor Reunion event in New York last year. That's what I did, I attended this event and I was like the only Canadian instructor there. And what did I do to prepare? So I tried to prepare, like talked about the importance of preparing, preparing my questions is I looked at the list of people who were going and I looked at, okay, who are these people that I wanna deepen the relationship with? And so I identified, cause there were like a lot of people attending. So I identify the list of people. And then what I did was I send them a DM message on LinkedIn to let them know that I'm going to be there, looking forward to meeting them. 
So I had like my top 10 people that I really wanted to meet. And that really helped, you know, to essentially, I would say, break the ice a bit, the awkwardness where you feel like I'm the only person from Canada coming, but at least I'm like, okay, there are 10 people that I want to meet to have a meaningful conversation. And from there, the people I really want to nurture with, I followed up. I actually remember that following week, I invited two instructors onto my show the following week where we talked about networking as well. And because I got to know those people at the event, they made me feel welcome and inviting. And so that's something I want to share because sometimes I know it can be daunting going to a networking event when you don't know anyone at all. But if you can do a little prep ahead of time and just send them that message, you're going to feel more excited, something to look forward to as well. Yeah. Amazing. I love this. Story. Yes, I would. <laughs> I love the story. I uh, recently had a client who was going to a networking event, very similar experience where she didn't know anyone. It's a new industry that she's trying to get into. And she just joined my program. So she was very early in her journey. So we really had to strategize how to get her feeling confident going into this event very quickly. And the same advice I gave her was to have just a few people in mind that she wants to meet. And I know you said 10, but you're a pro. <laughs> For her, I said, hey, if your goal is three people, four people, five people that you talk to at this event, that's great. Your goal doesn't have to be 10 people, 20 people, because when you're starting out, especially on this journey, it can be a little bit overwhelming. But the strategy remains the same identifying those few people that you actually do want to talk to, sending them a quick message that you'll be at that event too, and then really trying to make sure that you connect. That's very great advice. Great advice. And speaking of that event, I networked all day that day. I know it could be draining. I literally went from morning to nighttime networking and it was a lot, but I was prepared and because I was only there for a few days, but it was something I really want to maximize my, my time there. So absolutely. All right. So let's move on to the next question here. All right. Well, uh, Diana, I would love for you to share some strategies for turning those casual connections, casual conversations into actually meaningful relationships. This is such a great question, right? How to turn your online casual co connections to meaningful professional relationships, right? Like, I'm curious to hear from the audience, like how many of you have like met some amazing people the last few years like online there and this is something that i'm really excited to talk about and it's a part of my course as well and so a few things that i do my first three strategies i'm going to share here number one is to start engaging in people's content online start engaging so that you become visible to them right have some meaningful conversations share your point of view uh give an acknowledgement and reshare the content and that's a great way to start essentially for them to be top of mind and then strategy number two is to start that conversation through DMs, right? So that's a step two. Once you really um, have built that visibility that they noticed you is start that DM conversation. And that way you can also start that conversation or casual conversation there, right? Ask them questions, share them a little about you, show common interest, find common ground as well, build that relationship. Don't just get into the DM be like, hey, can we hop on a call when you haven't really built that relationship yet, okay? Like try to have that mini chat conversation. And from there, step three, is then propose a virtual meetup. So this could be through a Zoom meeting after you build that trust and rapport. Uh, you could have that video chat to really deepen that connection. And then the bonus step for if you happen to be in the same city, same area, invite for an in-person meetup there to really deepen that relationship. Now, sometimes you don't necessarily have to be in the same city, right? But if you're close enough, you can also do that as well. So I'll give you an example. Like last year, our friend Tiffany Uman, who lives in Montreal, and I'm here in Toronto, um, I actually invited her to uh, come visit me for the weekend. And we made it happen. We had like a weekend together and it was so great. That was the start to our beautiful friendship there, where we really took the time to invest in that professional relationship. Okay, so some of these are strategies like that you can take from going to online to offline and uncovering new possibilities together there. I love this, Diana. I love the the strategy around connecting with with someone's content and then building up that connection. Uh, one thing I would add to that is you will notice that some people are not actually very active online, and some people don't create content or don't post a lot on whether it's LinkedIn or any other social media platform. 
So with, with, with those people in mind, and it oftentimes depends on the industry <laughs> uh, that you're trying to, to break into, with, with, with those scenarios, I would still reach out to them following the same, the same strategy, something I would always keep in mind. And that's what I teach my students every single time to do is to give people a compliment when you reach out to them. So something that you saw on their profile that you admire, that you really like, that's number one. And number two, tell them why you reached out, how you came across their profile. I love the, 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 position it from the perspective of, I came across your profile looking for X, right? So don't just send them a message out of nowhere, especially if it's a cold message. If there's a connection, mention a connection, a common connection. If not, try to find something in common, how you found them. That really helps to put things into perspective for them and that connection to start building from the very first time you reach out. That is such great advice, right? Giving that compliment acknowledgement, it's a great way essentially to build that likability. I had that actually. So this is a very interesting, right? It's like, what makes someone want to actually have a conversation with you? Like I've had instances where people would just randomly reach out where I would decline that chat, where I've had some instances where people first time reaching out, I will hop on a call immediately. And so what distinguished that when I think about this online connection is really back to this acknowledgement where they've actually paid attention to done some research and able to either acknowledge or comment or share. Like I remember I had a, a coach just a few months ago who actually watched my videos and watched my talks and able to recite some of the things that like some key tips that I found really helpful. And we hopped on the call like really like the following um, like week there. And so a big part is that, you know, you know do you come across as genuine, uh, Lee interested in the other person and actually really want to build that relationship there? Now, so Anna, my next question for you here is what are some of those common mistakes that people make uh, when networking, especially during a career transition there? Oh, this is a big question. There's, there's a lot to cover here, but if you know me at all, I like things in threes. <laughs> so uh, let's do top three. So when it comes to networking while making a career pivot, here are some of the, some, here are the top three mistakes that I see. Mistake number one is being too narrow with your outreach. So that can look like only reaching out to, let's say, the hiring manager for your dream role. And while it is the ultimate goal to talk to them, often it takes several conversations and introductions to get to the right person. So don't be too narrow with your outreach. Number two is giving up too quickly. Most people send out three messages and decide it's not working. It's something that I talk with my students during coaching every single week. They tell me, I tried networking, it's not working. And I ask them a question, how many people, how many messages have you sent? They're like, four. <laughs> so realistically, if it is a new industry for you, and these are cold messages that you are that you're sending out. And these are people that you have no connection with. There is no one that you know in common who can introduce you. Even if your messaging is perfect, it can still take, it probably will be, it probably will take more than three messages for you to start actually meeting people. And I want to give you, I want to share an example of one of my students. And I have hundreds of examples like this, but one, one of the recent examples comes to mind. Uh, one of my students inside my coaching program said, Hey, I have this dream company that I really want to work for. And I went all out. So the, our calls are on Tuesday. So she says last Thursday, I went all out. I reached out to 48 people on Thursday by Tuesday. So it's less than a week. She has already talked to five people. How incredible is that? And she not only talked to them, three of them said, hey, here's my phone number. Add me on WhatsApp and just let's, let's stay connected so that I can help you. One of them added her to um, an industry Slack group. All of that happened between Thursday and Tuesday. But she did reach out to 48 people. 
And then mistake number three is pitching yourself. Going into networking thinking, I need to tell them everything about me. I need to tell them how great I am, how successful I have been in my current career and show them that I want to transition into a new career. Well, you're not there yet. You're not there yet to pitch yourself. You haven't built trust or relationship yet. So talk to them first. Ask them questions. Remember, 90% of the time, it's you asking questions. Sorry, it's you asking questions and 90% of the time, it's them talking. So you're not pitching yourself yet. You're there to learn. And you're pitching yourself through asking those questions and giving them space to share. And once you give them space to share, people want to reciprocate. People want to give back because you gave them that space to share. Now they feel like, oh, I want to do something for you. I love that. One thing I'm going to add on to this that I've seen another common mistake I see people make is coming across too desperate when they first reach out that they really are asking people to, um, to help them immediately there when they haven't actually built a trust and rapport. And I want to share a story that I always talk about is to never just ask for a favor without building trust and rapport. So many years ago, I had a client where I made an introduction to something I do a lot is paying it forward to make introductions to open doors opportunities uh, to a, a connection of mine. And my client tried to really accelerate the relationship here and basically ask like, hey, I see you are connected so and so at this other company. Can you make an introduction for me? And so my friend basically messaged me like, I thought they wanted to meet with me. But this person that sounds like is using me, like, can I trust this person here? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be that person where you haven't spent time to actually nurture that relationship and ask for a favor where they feel like you're taking advantage of them or making it transactional. Right? This is something I would say commonly see, especially for those who feel like they're really desperate. They just want to move quickly. It doesn't happen that way. I had a client um, a couple of years ago. She was transitioning from entrepreneurship to corporate uh, for the first time. And the way she did it, she actually had over 90% response rate and was really good at networking. And uh, I actually connected her to another client of mine who was more senior in a leadership role, worked for a big insurance company. They connected, had a great uh, relationship. She followed up through the DMs to stay in touch. A few months later in the summer, an opening, a new role opened up. And that's how she got put in front of the hiring manager to get hired there. And so sometimes we can't expect the outcome to be immediate and fast. It really takes time. But did you make that first uh, great impression there? I want to share. This made me think of um, a story that my my client shared with me yesterday, actually. So he he was sharing with me that he landed two off. Out. He is extremely happy. Uh, offers in a new country with Fortune 10, 100, uh, for, Fortune 10 companies. And he showed me his networking tracker. So in inside my course, I give them a networking tracker to use. So he shared that with me. And he showed me the notes that he's been keeping and taking after each meeting. And he writes down all the personal pieces that those people have shared with him. So whether that's, you know, they like hiking or they're going on a trip in September. So he's writing all of that down so that now, even after he's landed the job, he can continue to stay in touch with them on that personal level. And I can guarantee that he's set up for success in his career from now on. Oh my God. I love that story because they are paying attention to the details, the personalization. That's really part of the strategy is personalization. You just remember another story of another young new grad client. He met over 200 people when he tried to pivot into um, investment banking. And he wrote a note to thank every single person he talked to when he got into investment banking to thank them for their time, their insights, their introductions. And I was like, you just build a strong 200 people network after this journey there. And so I want to ask the audience, like, what are some mistakes that you've made during your, your networking journey? And what are some things that you want to implement based on the things that we've been sharing uh, so far there? Amazing, amazing. So let's move into the next question there. All right. So Diana, in the era of digital networking, how can one leave a lasting impression? And how important is personal branding in trying to achieve that? This is such a great question, right? 
you know, how many of you believe network personal branding is important uh, that ties into networking here, right? Like to me, personal branding is essential to build a strong network, especially in digital networking, right? When you think about it, personal branding essentially is like that first impression of what you want to be known for. You're building your reputation, your credibility. And how that ties into networking here is that you want to first really have a strong digital profile, right? So for those that say, for example, whether you're on LinkedIn is you want to create a trustworthy online profile. This could mean having a great picture, a great uh, bio, having more a complete profile where people can really get to know you. You want to be able to showcase um, essentially warmth, uh, approachability as well, where people feel like, okay, you are serious about networking as well, right? I call it the difference between whether you have a, um, a comprehensive robust profile or whether you have a skeleton profile, especially on LinkedIn, right? A skeleton profile is really that bare bones where it shows your name, your job titles, and that's it. But when you have a complete profile, it really shows that, okay, you are here and you want to engage with other people there. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, the second piece is that if you are active on different social media platforms is that you want to maintain consistency across different platforms, meaning, for example, having a similar profile or bio picture so that people can recognize you throughout different channels there. Okay? And then step three here is that you really want to have a be active online. Right. The part of it is being active online so that you can engage in meaningful conversations, share valuable content, respond promptly to interactions. Right. That's about being active, right? Being active so people see that you are here, you're here to build relationships. And that is really what's going to help essentially people see that making that first a great impression. So oftentimes I would say when I think about the people I've met, even just recently, um, is really just that the way they communicate, let's talk about communication here, is that it comes across as authentic, it comes across genuine, it comes across as curious, like it has this warmth factor where it feels like you're having a good conversation versus feeling that there's still tension there, right? Because at the end of the day, when you think about it, is that if you really want to move forward in the relationship, oftentimes one of those questions people ask is like, do I trust you? Do I like you? Do I want to spend more time? with you, right? These are that instant human connection we think about to determine whether I want to invest time and energy into that relationship. So making that great first impression is really essential to move forward in the connection there. Thank you for sharing this, Diana. I, as you were, as you were talking about it, uh, I remembered something that I learned in said, I now teach my students as well. And it's, while you are coming into networking prepared with your questions, it's still a human conversation. It's not really an interview. And something that I remember I was clearly taught how to do in sales was to sprinkle <laughs> some personal pieces into that conversation. And it can be, as you're learning how to do that, it can be as simple as, let's say you're at, at a coffee shop shop and you're grabbing coffee together. It can be as simple as asking, oh, are you, are you a coffee drinker? Oh, I noticed you got tea. Are you a big tea drinker? And get them to share a couple of things, a couple of sentences around that. It can be as simple as, let's say you're grabbing lunch together and there is a, um, a sport game on the screen in that, in that restaurant. Ask them, oh, do you, do you follow hockey if hockey's on the screen? Oh, talk about hockey for a minute and then bring it back to what you're there to talk about, which is their path, their career and learn from them. So it still wants to, like you still want it to be <laughs> a genuine human conversation and not just you interviewing them. Absolutely. I love that. I want to share a couple of stories because I hope this help reinforces like for people we're listening here is how sometimes it, we don't need to force certain interactions. It doesn't have to be like, I have to ask the question there. So really just a couple of days ago, I was shopping for our, preparing for a trip to Paris here. And I was at sport check looking for a particular item. I couldn't find it, right? I found all the items I needed for, for my kids, my husband, I couldn't find it. I was about to give up. And there's a salesperson who came up. They're like, oh, it seems like you got a lot of stuff. Like, you know, is there anything else that you're still looking for? She asked us that one question. I was like, yeah, in fact, I do. Like, I'm looking for this one item here. And she got it instantly. Like, she nailed that item. And she found it. I was like, wow, that's amazing. This is what I'm looking for. Essentially, it was a jacket that I'm looking for. And then she asked me the next question. Um, what do you need it for? 
I was like, oh, I'm preparing for this trip and I'm going to Paris. And she just asked me that next was like, oh, what's it about? And so we started having this conversation, like just a really mini chit chat conversation. At the end of the day, Anna, she recommended me like five more items and I bought all of them because she knew my needs. Like this goes back to like a simple interaction. She has a couple questions to understand my needs and pretty much every single item she recommended. I was like, yes, I need that. And I was so actually impressed. I actually gave that um, glowing review to the manager when I checked out. I was like, I've never had a salesperson like this who would just come in, uh, ask me a question. And at the end of the day, I was able to get the items I need out there. So I hope that helps. Like, we don't have to force sometimes that interaction to be like, this has to be happen this way. And over 10 years ago, I used to recruit for a, an executive MBA program of selling a $100,000 program to very senior level people. Oftentimes I would meet people who are at the C level, VP level. And at first I would feel a little intimidating of meeting people very senior because I'm like, oh, what if I don't know their company, their industry, or I don't have enough knowledge. And what I found was that I didn't need to have all that knowledge. What I needed was more curiosity. Curiosity is showing interest in the work that they did and also sharing a bit of my own personal journey of why I did an MBA, what I got out of it, what the challenges are. And literally within an hour conversation, often these very senior people would share their entire life story with me. Like I would walk away blown away, like, wow, I just learned some really personal stuff about this person, not just about the business or what they do, but actually the personal life or the insecurities they have, insecurities they have about pursuing uh, for, um, higher education there. And so this goes back to really just that curiosity mindset, right? And that the warmth piece there. I'm curious to hear from the audience, what are you learning so far from this? I'm seeing the chats here, like we have a really engaging audience and over a hundred people are live with us. What are some of your key takeaways so far based on what we're sharing? We're having like a really juicy conversation here. So feel free to share with us either what you're learning or some of your personal journey of your experiences with regards to networking there. What's your biggest takeaway so far? So Anna, my next question to you, which is ties into a bit of what we've been talking about already is how can we use social media for networking without coming across as disingenuous or spammy? Mm -hmm. A lot of people are worried about being spammy, feeling coming across as when it comes to networking. And here are three tips to avoid feeling spammy. Number one, customize your messaging. Same messaging that if you, if you use the same messaging when you reach out to different people, if you use the exact same message, just copy paste, I can guarantee it's not good enough. That's the first piece here. Number two, be genuinely curious. Don't reach out just because you want a referral, just because you want an interview, just because you saw something online and you really need to talk to someone because there is a job open. You're reaching out to learn. And the final one is try different mediums. It can look like uh, a DM on LinkedIn. It can look like commenting on, on, on any posts that that person has. It can look like email. And I uh, have shared the story on, on my social media before, but I have recently been trying to connect with someone and it's... I'm not going to go into detail what that's for yet, but it's it, it would be a really big step forward for me in my career as an entrepreneur and as a career coach. And I got an introduction, direct introduction to that person via email through someone we both know. And I know that the person I'm trying to connect to really trusts the person who connected us. And it was actually Diana who connected us. <laughs> um, so I had seemingly that way in. Well, here's what happened next. I followed up with that person six times via email over the course of a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, realistically. Then I sent a LinkedIn connection request with a note. I sent a LinkedIn message and I even found that person on Instagram <laughs> and sent them a direct message on Instagram. And you know what worked out of all of those mediums? Direct message on Instagram even though it was for a professional, my goal was professional. So oftentimes, just that one message on LinkedIn is not enough. We are busy. 
there is so much that's going on in everyone's life lives and we are bombarded online with so many things coming at us so try different mediums this is such a great story on the importance of trying different mediums but also persistency and following up and not giving up right this is a great example most people just give up at the first try i've had classmates i haven't talked to in over a decade they reached out to me on linkedin and I didn't respond because I just, sometimes get too many messages. I just forgot. <laughs> they reach out to me through Instagram and they can get my response right away because it's not as busy over there uh, for me there. And so you just sometimes have to try different mediums. Like I don't think like for me, like I don't purposely try to ignore people unless it's a very spammy message there. Uh, sometimes there may be just too many messages and we ought to try different angles, try different type of messaging to get that there, right? Yeah, so Mark shared that he had to do 400 networking calls over eight months the first half of 2020. And, and one thing I would say, because I know Mark comes from a sales background, what's something I've learned, and I've seen on a lot of my sales clients, Anna, is that I find that those come from a sales background, they understand the importance of building a funnel for networking. They, they recognize that not every person you reach out to is going to respond. Right. So I want to talk about that. It's like, you know, creating that funnel of people that you will want to reach out to and also then also spread them out, prioritize of how often or frequent that you will want to reach out to them. You don't need to reach out to like, like the 400 people all at once because that's too much energy draining for you there. You can spread them out throughout the course of X number of, of months there. Um, yeah, so this is great. I've seen a lot of great engagement that we, we have uh, there. So thank you for sharing that story, Anna. All right. Shall we move on to the next question? Yeah, we should. Right. Yes. So if you are in a position where you are changing careers, how can one leverage their network to transition into that new role or new industry? Mm -hmm. This is such a great question, right? This is something that I would say I've supported many clients in career transition or making a significant career pivot. And networking is definitely a key component. One thing I noticed is that oftentimes networking, people do find it's one of the most challenging aspects, but it can also be the one of the most rewarding aspects. So I want to share a few key pieces of advice here. Number one is to really focus first on seeking advice, right? Reach out to your contacts to seek advice in your desired uh, areas of um, industry or companies to get advice and insights on the company, the role, the culture, the people, because their insider knowledge can really help guide you through that inner move there. Okay. Number two is to really communicate your goals as well. Once you got really got to know them or shared more about it, communicate your goals clearly of what you're looking for. One of the common feedback I hear from my, my own network is that I hear from the feedback is that people aren't really clear of what exactly they're looking for, or they may say that I'm open to anything, or it could be anything. And it's really hard for someone to help you when you don't clearly articulate what is it that you're truly looking for there. Okay. So one of my strategy that I teach my clients is to really try to describe in a way of what your ideal um, role is in a way that they could visualize a person or an opportunity or company that they could introduce you to there. The next piece is really around um, leveraging those existing relationships that you already have, right? Start with the network you have, right? The warm network where you feel comfortable to get your feet wet, right? Because they already somewhat know you already, right? They know a bit about your strengths, your background. Now, if they haven't really worked with you, they may not know exactly what you have done. So it's really important to have these messages ready as well in terms of your branding messages of what you bring to the table so that they can also um, essentially uh, recommend you to someone else there. Okay. The next piece here is my advice is really to be being open to new, new opportunity and possibilities. While I say you want to be clear, but sometimes that, let's say that opportunity or the company may not be on your radar, you want to have an open mind, right? Because you just never know what may open up just by having that open uh, possibilities mindset there, okay? Be receptive of those new possibilities, okay? And one of the things I always ask about it, if you have actually developed a genuine relationship and trust, most of the time, like I just, from my experience is that if you really have built that, people will ask like, how can I help you? At the end, they're like, how can I help you? How can I serve you? What would be helpful there, right? Ask, make an ask. What is it that you wanna ask? Is it either an introduction or is it, you know, learning more about the company, whatever that is, get really clear what's that next ask or what you want to learn about that will give you that advantage there. I once had a client who made a huge transition from um, working in the public sector uh, as a campaign manager to pivoting into tech. 
he talked to over a dozen people in this one company. Like I introduced him, his classmate introduced him, and then my connection introduced him. And what the way he did it was also really general, not just through introductions, but he really showed a keen interest in the company. He did his research, he read a lot of industry reports, understood the challenges there. And at the end of the day, multiple people bat for him, like not just me, but his own friends as well. And that really gave that essentially that, um, that trust factor, the credibility factor to help him move forward into this new area there. All right, so those are some of the key techniques. A lot of times people ask me like, you know, is it possible? Like, is it possible to make a big change through networking? I absolutely believe that. I really, really do, Anna, because even though, especially when you don't have a strong reputation, a strong brand or credibility in this new sector, in this new area, you really want to essentially leverage your own network who could help you uh, as well or develop those new relationships out there. Oh my gosh. I am a big believer that the key component in career change is networking. It's one of the key puzzle pieces. Uh, in fact, next week, Tuesday and Wednesday, I have a live masterclass all about career pivot. And we will talk about how networking plays into it. Um, but a couple of things that I wanted to, to add, Diana, when you guys are thinking about making that ask, I would always plan it ahead of time, what you actually want to ask them, but I would keep it until the very end of your conversation. This is not what we open with. It's yeah. not something we bring up in the middle of the conversation. You're still, you still need to go through that conversation to start building trust. Just think about it. This is the last thing that you're going to ask them before you finish the meeting is making that ask. And it can happen. Career change can happen so quickly. I had a client a couple of years ago she, she was a pharmacist, so she felt like she was in a very niche career, very niche skills, and she pivoted to tech sales in two months. And it all it took was reaching out to a few hiring managers and getting a conversation with them and pretty much bypassing the whole application process, the ATS, the recruiters, and getting the person who has the power to hire her right away. And I have so many stories like that where people pivot 180 degrees all through getting in front of the right people. And another piece that I would want you, for you guys to think about is when um, you are people in the company that you're targeting, in the industry that you're targeting, you're learning of the insider knowledge that you can't Google. So when you get to the interview stage, this is partially how you're going to stand out because your knowledge of what you're going to be working on, the clients, the projects, the challenges that they have is so much deeper than anyone else who has the direct experience and anyone else who just read the job description. And on the one hand, you're showing that I have done all of this research and I have gone above and beyond to really make sure that this is what I want. And I'm showing you this way that I really want this opportunity versus I just randomly applied for it online. And if it works out, it, it works out. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. What you're referring to, it's, it's essentially closing the gap, right? You're, you're closing the gap by essentially giving more indicators of your interest, your enthusiasm, your knowledge about a, a new opportunity there. I had a client last year, it was actually a friend of mine who was pivoting from entrepreneurship to corporate, never worked in corporate before, um, didn't really have like a people manager leadership type of role, but he pivoted essentially from entrepreneurship to the gaming industry and a people manager role. He talked to like dozens of people in the industry to learn more. And because he's a gamer, he was able to connect with a hiring manager right off the bat, just by noticing the background of the hiring managers, something about gaming that they were able to connect right away, instantly. Um, and he went above and beyond to learn more about the company, the games and all that, the production. And, and he got an offer. He got an offer. And he was, and this was also uh, from, Can uh, he was in Canada, but the offer was in US. And so he was able to, they got the company to also pay for its entire family to move to the US. And so to me, like a hiring manager would not do that 
if they don't believe in your capabilities of what you have to offer or that you have that trust factor that they believe that, hey, like they see the potential in you, right? You have to be able to really go above and beyond to showcase you've done your research, not just saying like, oh, I have an interest in gaming, but be like, yeah, I know gaming. <laughs> like I, I know the games I've been playing. Like that, like that's the above and beyond factor that could make a huge difference as well, especially when you're going to into like highly competitive roles, highly competitive industry or companies of this. You want to think about well, how can we go above and beyond to stand out? Yeah. So Anna, I know we're going to be wrapping up here. I'm going to have the last question here. I'm going to ask the audience as many questions. Let us know as we wrap up here. My last question for you is ties into following up. The importance of following up. I know you already shared the story here. Can you share with the audience what are some key strategies out of following up effectively? Following up in networking is key, but most people are afraid to do it and don't do it enough. So here are three tips for you. Number one, shift your mindset. You're not bugging people, but rather most people need to be followed up with. And most people, in fact, appreciate the follow up. What tends to happen, people would see your message and they're commuting home from work or they're in the middle of a work meeting and they think, okay, cool, I'll respond later. And then they just forget. So you're not bugging them. You're just reminding them that I've sent you. Think about it this way. Most people appreciate the follow-up. Number two, set reminders for yourself to follow up. Once you reach out to someone, immediately Go into your calendar and set reminders to follow up with them. Diana earlier talked about the funnel that salesperson tend to have. I come from a sales background and that's exactly what we used to do. You just know that this is how many people it tends to take to get a response. Then out of those responses, how many people would lead to a meeting and that's it. And every time you reach out to someone, you just immediately go in and set a, a follow-up reminder for yourself. And number three, offer specific dates and times to meet when you follow up. So this way, your follow-up messages are slightly different. It's not just you saying, hey, I'm following up. Can we connect? But get a little bit more specific. And it's something, again, it's a sales trick that I learned is offering people your availability, telling them, hey, I'm free this week, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday all day, and Thursday morning. You can go even as far as adding a link to your calendar. Hey, to make it easier, here's a link to my calendar. If there is a time that works for you, just grab a spot. And you'll be surprised how effective this is. And the story that I shared earlier when it was six emails, LinkedIn DMs, IG DMs, what ended up for me, actually what really worked to actually get the meeting was including a link to my schedule. Because this way they don't, there's no back and forth. Oh, when are you available? When are you available? You're just skipping that. And it makes it a lot easier for people to respond to you, to get, to get that on your calendar. So that would be my third tip here tip here. That is fantastic advice. I, I actually learned that strategy as well, like offering your available either this or that, like the options, and then add in like the link there to make it easier. Something I've also learned is that in my recruiting days is that try to always end with that call to action by framing it as a question, like, are you free at this time or, or something like a question, whatever the ask is, so that it helps with uh, getting the response right there. Like even I've had before where I use things like let me know either way, like if you're interested or not, just to like, yes, no. Uh, there, I've had people sometimes like when they want a quick response from me, they'll give me options like ABC for like a quick question to answer. Uh, for example, someone asked me, um, you know, what should I wear for an interview, for example, and have like A, B, and C. And I could actually respond quick, quickly because it was just A, B, and C type of option uh, there. So, so try different ways of, of, of with your communication message. And we have someone, a, a comment here from, um, from Katie about, uh, as a younger professional, I found that people do not appreciate the constant follow-up or multimedia uh, contacting. What's, what's, what's your take here? Ooh, this is a good question, Katie. So 
first I would think about why do you believe for that to be true? That people don't appreciate the follow-up. Is it that someone actually said that? Hey, I don't want you to follow up anymore. Or is it something that we tend to believe about ourselves that, oh, I should, I should stop following up. I've already sent three messages, two messages. And oftentimes you learn that it really is our own assumption that we're bugging people. But rather, most people just don't see those messages. So I would just just uh, shift that perspective for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're not bugging people. You're helping them see that message. And yeah. I would also, when it comes to different mediums, assess the industry you're in or what industry you're looking to get into and how active people are on those other platforms. So if you find that someone is very active on Twitter, you'll see that that's the medium that they use. So you can go outside of LinkedIn and reach out to them or follow up with them or send them a tweet. However, if you're finding someone's personal family account on Instagram, that might be taking it a little bit too far. But if you find someone's professional account on, let's say, Instagram or Twitter or any other platform, then that multimedia aspect comes in. Yeah, that's great advice here. I want to address another question that Mark has is, when networking with non-hiring managers, what's the purpose of follow-up if they have no action items or have already completed it? Mm -hmm. This is a great perspective. I want to add my two cents to this. So my experience is most people don't follow up. Even when I see myself as I want to go out to speak to hundreds of people, typically like less than 2% or 1% of people will actually follow up, right? So those who do, do stand out. And even if there are no action items, the way I look at a follow-up it could be a, a acknowledge message, maybe acknowledgement of like, what, what did you appreciate? What did you learn? What you found insightful? or um, what you plan on doing next, even there's no follow-up from that other person, but it's just like, it's almost like a simple thank you uh, could be really useful as well. Now, but maybe, I don't know, there are instances where you don't follow up, but I would say even last year, I remember when I went out to network with a lot of people, I've had tons of people say like, yeah, I'm going to ask you to help me with so-and-so or reach out to so-and-so and they don't follow up. So if they don't follow up, I'm not going to take action on it, right? If you're asking me to do something to make an introduction and you don't follow follow up. Yeah. I love this question because I find that a lot of people tend to exclusively focus on the hire managers. And that's great because they do have the power to hire you. However, I actually teach my students six different types of people that you can be reaching out to and the benefits of reaching out to each. And that's everyone from in-house recruiter to external headhunters to people who do the exact same job that you want to do to people who are a lot more higher up because here's what I would think about. Just the benefit of having a diverse network. If it's, let's say, a recruiter, they would know about opportunities, let's say, that are coming down the pipe. If it is uh, someone who does the exact same job that you want to do, imagine how much you can learn from them about the job that you're considering. If it's someone very senior, again, there's so much that you can learn from them. So don't just look for the hiring managers. It's actually important for you to have a diverse network. And another piece I would offer you here is you never know <laughs> what can come up in the conversation, what you can learn from that person. You never know what they know and you never know who they know and who they can connect you to. And I loved, uh, Diana, your, your, your tip around just acknowledging that I loved our conversation. Something that I often offer to my students is to add would it be okay if I keep you posted on my job search journey? And again, this is a tip that I learned in sales. The thing is, of course, everyone's going to say yes. 
It's just one of those questions that everyone's going to say yes to. But this way, they're giving you permission to now follow up, to now send them another message and continue growing that relationship so that, let's say, three years from now, when you see, oh, we have this person knows someone I really want to talk to. Now you feel at ease reaching out to that original connection and asking for introduction, even though they were not the hiring manager. So there is definitely yeah, a absolutely. lot of value in having a diverse network. Yes, you're absolutely right. Having that, that diverse network is, is important because you just never know, right? Because you And you learn different things from um, different people or different levels, different industries. And, and that's, that's the power. And I find when I look, work with clients who have been in the same industry, let's say over a decade, 20 years, that their network may just be really narrow into just their own, let's say, company. And it feels scary. Um, but this is where I want to encourage people to start broadening as well, diversifying your network. And I think in today's digital age is go global as well, not just local, but go global, especially for those who want to work uh, overseas or want to do more like remote work, like look internationally uh, as well. So, so this was such a great juicy conversation, Anna. I love it. I love that we just have different perspectives and takes. Share with us what your key takeaways are. And and um, Anna, like, let's, let's start with, you know, how people can find you. Tell us a bit more about your, your course and your class that you have. Share with us. We're going to put the links up here as well for the audience. All right. I love this conversation. I think I can talk about networking for hours and hours and hours because there is so much depth to this. And it is definitely a skill that absolutely every single person can learn. I truly wholeheartedly believe that Every single person, no matter where you are right now, whether it seems scary and icky right now, you're an introvert, you don't know anyone, you can absolutely learn it, learn it pretty quickly and excel at it. And this is something that I teach step by step by step in depth inside my course, Network Like a Pro, everything from how to shift your mindset from this is icky, I don't know if I can do this to, wow, I'm in love with this. This is incredible to exactly who to reach out to, exactly what to say, how to tweak your messaging, how to lead that meeting in a strategic way, step by step. It. I've had hundreds of people take the course and I get messages on Instagram every single day saying that, hey, I booked this many meetings in this in these days. This happened. I got this interview in, in a couple of weeks all through reaching out to people. And the biggest piece for me with networking is seeing that you're starting to enjoy it, that it becomes yeah. natural. And it's not something that you just do right now when you're, let's say, job searching. But once you tap into it and you see the power of it, you realize, oh my gosh, I want to continue doing this because this is going to fast track my career. And for those of you who our career changers, uh, as I mentioned, next week, July 18th, 19th, I have the Pivot Masterclass. Masterclass, it's live, it's free. We'll talk all about how to change careers without it from the bottom. And we will talk about networking, of course, and we'll focus on what networking will look like when you are changing careers. What about yourself, Amazing. Dan? I know you have a new LinkedIn course. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you coming back as well. I, I really love the work that you do. And I highly recommend for those who are tuning in right now, definitely check out Anna's course and also the masterclass next week. I know it's going to be like top notch there. So I highly, highly recommend it. So for me, I would say go check out um, all my LinkedIn learning courses that have come out. So I have the latest course is on digital networking, which is only six minutes long. It's 11 mini videos that you can watch from mobile there. I also have a course on increasing your physically at work that's coming out august 8th in like just next month and uh, so it's all about helping build your reputation at work to get more opportunities and then my other recent course that was launched last month was on navigating bias and stereotypes as an asian american professional and then i have another course is on how to pivot your career as well like a mini nano course so it's a great complementary to like what anna's doing as well so i highly recommend checking it out. I think the reason why I really partnered up with Anna doing this is because we, we both share that common uh, passion and mission and really helping ambitious professionals, right, to, to thrive in, in their careers by really building a strong brand, building a strong network. We really believe that it's possible for you, especially in today's uh, age. I know that we support so many people pivot their careers. 
right? Making significant big career changes and it's totally possible, right? We may believe that it's not, but it's totally possible there. So we hope you found uh, today's as a uh, uh, live uh, useful there. Yeah, we got a lot of some comments right now. Anna, you see like you're thanking us for this as well. Uh, Candace, uh, welcome back here. Great content, extremely helpful and suggestions, which is greatly appreciated. So, so thank you so much here. And some key takeaways here is around the curiosity, curate, communicate. Amazing, amazing. The three C's. I love that. Love that. So, so this was so great. I love it. I'm going to, this week is all about networking for me, Anna, like the, the course, this, and tomorrow I'm hosting a social lunch for like 20 plus entrepreneurs in Toronto here. Right? Like it's going to be amazing. I'm so, I'm just so excited to do it in person that. networking. I'm so sad. I'm, <laughs> I'm so that. excited. Yeah. I wish you could come, but it was, it's so, it was so exciting. This is the power of connection, right? The community. Um, and, and I want to share like even this event too, like I didn't do a lot of like advertising it was through some DMs, people recommending people. And that's how we filled it up. Like it's sold out. Uh, so really excited to have that local networking opportunity in person uh, with people there. And I'm looking forward to traveling with you in a couple of weeks where we're going to be shopping, so eating and masterminding on. together as well. <laughs> So it's going to be amazing. I yes. enjoyed our conversation so much. And thank you everyone for being engaged and for asking questions and for being open to learn. I know it can be a bit of an intimidating topic, but you can absolutely, I wholeheartedly believe that you can absolutely excel at networking and fall in love with it. And it doesn't have to be scary. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time and presence. I appreciate you. Take care, Bye, everyone. everyone.